We are continuing on page 26 of the Australian Prayer Book, uh, and we're going to say the Apostles' Creed together. Uh, I invite you, if you can, to stand with me uh, and uh, confess the things that Christians have confessed for 2,000 years. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me introduce you to Adam and Grace. They met through a mutual friend, and from day one, they seemed to be perfect for each other. Grace was everything that Adam always wanted. She was beautiful, outgoing, and caring, always there when Adam needed her. For the first five months, they were inseparable. Adam could hardly think of anything but grace. He didn't need to look further. He told his friends, she's the one. But after three years, things are a bit different. Adam still enjoys the comfort and the familiarity of being with Grace, but the spark has gone. Grace's flaws seem more obvious, and he's not sure he finds her as attractive as he once did, and he's beginning to resent all the time she wants to spend with him. One day, she asks him if they can define their relationship, and he blows up. We're together, aren't we? He asks angrily, why isn't that enough for you? Obviously, Adam isn't yet ready for commitment. He's not sure whether he'll ever be ready or needs to ever be ready. Well, have you ever been in a relationship like that? Do you know people who are? There are millions of Adams walking around today, but that's not the way it should be. God wants Adams of this world to be in a relationship defined by passion and commitment. But I'm not talking about romance. Because grace isn't a girl, grace is the church. And this is the let's define the nature of our relationship talk. Last week, we started a new series, our vision series, called His Purpose, Our Purpose, My Purpose. And over five weeks, we're going to look at God's purpose for the world and what that means for you and me, together and individually, as we align ourselves to His purpose. And I suggested last week that there are five interlocking purposes all handling beginning with the letter M, magnification, membership, maturity, ministry, and mission. Today, we're going to focus on membership. And I'm using that word to define the nature of our relationship with the church and within the church. So the first and most obvious question to explore is, well, what is the church? And it's hard to get clarity on church when there are so many different uses for this word. So this week we had inquiries coming to the office along these lines. Can I park at the church? Can I use the church for an exhibition? Can I get married at the church? And here church is being used to mean a place or a building. But others view church as a set or system of beliefs. For instance, when somebody said to me recently, I'm not at all churchy, meaning I don't believe any of that stuff. And others still see a church as a sort of institution into which you're born. 
So another conversation I had this week when a lady said to me, well, I'm Anglican, but my, hother, my husband is Catholic. So that is irrespective of whether they go to any building or really any set of beliefs that they hold, church for them is an identity marker like nationality or, or ethnicity. But referring to the Bible, always a good idea, we see that the word uh, translated church comes from the Greek word ecclesia. ecclesia. And this is used just under 80 times in the New Testament, and mostly translated as the word church, but there are sometimes when a different word is used, which gives a clue as to the meaning of church. And that word is assembly or gathering. Church at its core simply means a crowd of people gathered together, but not just any mob. The word uh, ecclesia is made up of two Greek words, one meaning call and the other one out. So the word church really refers to those who have been called by God, called out by him and gathered together. And that is the basic definition of church. And it's crucial for us to understand that in when we understand and look at well, what is church about. To draw an analogy from Hollywood, for instance, in the Ocean's uh, Heist movie series, so Danny Ocean, he's the sort of leader of the gang, he calls out from the wider criminal fraternity specific uh, villains for his team, you know, Rusty and Reuben and Frank and Virgil and Turk, etc. He gathers them together, and the first thing they ask is, what's the job, Danny? And similarly for us, God calls us out and gathers us together, but for what? What's the job? So our next question is, well, what's the purpose of church? Last week we looked at the much broader question of what's the purpose of life? And the answer I gave is magnification. God created and saved us to magnify him. And he's worthy of magnification because he is magnus, he is great. And I listed many reasons how God is great. Focusing on his nature, his alive, his authoritative, his all-powerful, magnificent, revered, holy, gracious, and glorious. But God is also great because he has a great plan for the world. And we begin to see it in the letter of Ephesians. When Paul writes this, with all wisdom and understanding, he, God, made known to us the mystery of his will, which he purposed in Christ, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So that is where everything is going. God's grand plan is this, that everything, gathered together under Jesus. And that's been his plan from the very beginning. So in the Garden of Eden, all things are gathered to God. He made it, it's ordered, and harmony and peace, and everything is in perfect relationship with God, including humans who he created. But then these first people made the decision to magnify themselves rather than God. They decided to live their own way, make it all about them. The Bible calls this attitude and action sin. And the consequence of that is, of course, everything becomes disordered. There's no more peace and the harmony and relationship with God is broken. And what there was was unity and closeness. But now because of sin, there's disunity and distance. And so God removes his people from his presence. He judges their sin by scattering them. And this is a theme that runs right through the Bible. Whenever humanity sets itself up against God, then God scatters them. And when he saves them, he gathers them to himself. In the book of Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, the prophet looks forward to the day when everything is finally ordered. 
and harmonious and peaceful and everything will be in right relationship with God, just as it was in the beginning. And he refers to a particular person who will accomplish God's grand plan. He is the, called the root of Jesse. This is the Messiah, a son of King David. And in Isaiah, he, he says this, that God will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from all four quarters of the earth. And we later read that God declares he will expand this plan beyond his people Israel. This was our Old Testament reading. So Isaiah 56, 8, I will gather still others beside those already gathered. And the climax of his plan is revealed at the end of the book when he says, I'm about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. So this is God's plan, to gather people from all nations, tribes, and, and the cultures to himself that they might see his glory. That's the grand plan. And the church comes into it because the church is the vehicle which God uses to make this happen, to gather his people. And we can see uh, this from the New Testament reading from Ephesians. Paul is writing to the Gentiles and they were scattered and with a, a sort of massive division between them and the Jews. But this is what um, is said uh, by Paul. Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Sin and death and hostility between Jew and Gentile is finally dealt with on the cross. Jesus is the one who gathers these diverse people together into one humanity in one relationship with God. And what's the purpose? Well, further on in Ephesians, Paul says this, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he encompassed in Christ Jesus' own. And that is the great and glorious plan of God, to gather together a very diverse people to each other and to himself, in such a way that his greatness and glory is made known in the heavenly realms. There's a sense in which God calls all the rulers and authorities in the spiritual realm and says to them, take a look at St. John's Beecroft. That is what I've been working towards for all of history. My son made this possible. He brought all these diverse people together. He broke down the dividing wall. He says to the devil and his minions, Hey Satan and you demons, see this, not even the gates of hell are going to stop my son building his church. A church out of every tribe and language and peoples. So my point is this, even before the church is about us learning about God, about us serving one another, it's about us being gathered together by God, to see his glory and to make his glory known. To see God's glory and to make God's glory known. And as the church fulfills that purpose, then more people will come under the Lordship of Christ. 
Now, it's fundamental to grasp this, critical even. Before the church is about me or you, it's about God. Just as the purpose of our lives is not about us, so the purpose of the church is not about us. To illustrate this idea, let me draw an, another analogy from the, the final movie in the Ocean series, Ocean 8. In this movie, the leader of the team is Danny's younger sister, Debbie. And at the end of another successful heist, when the rest of the team are enjoying the spoils of their criminal activity, in the final scene is Debbie sitting in front of a memorial plaque of her dead brother. And she raises a martini to him. The motivation of the job, at least in part for her, was not the money. She did it to honour her brother. Similarly, God calls us out. He gathers us together as his church, not for our sakes, but for his, for his honour and glory. The purpose of church, the purpose of being a member of the church, it's not about us. It's about God. So that leads to another question, which is, well, what is church membership? Or put it another way, how can we be church members on purpose? First, let me say, you don't become a church member by attending church for a very long time, or by completing a membership course, or by signing a joining agreement. You become a member of God's church by repenting of living independently of him, by putting your trust in Jesus, and by receiving the Holy Spirit. That is the fundamental first step. Maybe that's a step you need to take today. And when you do that, something extraordinary happens, something supernatural. And Paul hints at this in his letter to the Ephesians in our reading um, we had today. When he says this, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. And he's more explicit earlier in his letter when he says this, God predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Church membership is not joining a club. Membership is being adopted into God's family. That is what membership is about. Now, in Paul's world, adoption was ordinarily of young adult males of good character to become heirs and maintain the family name of childless rich couples. But the gospel message is different from that. It is open to all people of whatever age, whatever sex or character, foreigners, strangers, even enemies of God. He adopts them not because of anything they've done, but through grace. He adopts them to become his heirs and co-heirs with Christ. So becoming a member of a church is entering a family, God's family, and that means it's about relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. Let's look briefly at each of those. So firstly, it means that God is our Father. Galatians 4, 6 says this, Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word. It's a respectful but intimate word for Father. Significantly, it's the word that Jesus himself uses when addressing God in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this means that that close, intimate relationship that Jesus, the Son, had with God the Father, that relationship, that's now available to us. This is utterly staggering. To understand how staggering it is, 
Just cast your mind back to last week and Isaiah's vision of God. God displayed in all his glory such that even the angels couldn't look upon him. And yet that God says to us, call me Papa, call me Daddy. What a privilege that is. And with that privilege comes the blessing of having the perfect Father. Unconditional love, lifelong commitment, devoted care, and guidance and discipline so that we might live our whole lives as his children. And this is how we are church members on purpose. Having been adopted into his family, we are called to reflect the family likeness. As Paul says again in Ephesians, follow God's example therefore as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Walk in the way of love, particularly and how we live with respect to each other. Because being adopted into God's family doesn't mean we have a new father only, it doesn't mean only that, it means we also have new siblings. We are brothers and sisters. We are family, as Sister Sledge once sung. We are, we are family. Being a church member on purpose is therefore about our lives as family. And you know that family life is real. It's where the rubber hits the road, doesn't it? It's where our beliefs and our values and our attitudes are translated into words and action. And there's plenty of guidance in the New Testament as to what this looks like. It starts with Jesus himself when he says this, this is our gospel reading, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you love one another. And the rest of the New Testament fleshes this out as to what it looks like. Are you ready to be inundated? So Paul says, in Christ each member belongs to all the others. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourself. Instruct one another. Have equal concern for one another. Serve one another with love. Carry each other's burdens. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Submit to one another out of reverence and Christ. In humility, consider others better than yourself. Do not lie to one another. Encourage one another. Always try to be kind to each other. The book of Hebrews joins the chorus. Spur one another on to love and good works. James pipes up. Don't slaughter one another. Don't grumble against each other. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for one another. Peter joins in. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Well, that's probably more than enough. What is the theme here? Otherness, isn't it? Otherness. Being God's family means loving, Christ-exalting, other person-centred personal relationships. There's no such thing as isolated, individualistic, meet my needs, consumer Christianity in the Bible. It doesn't exist. So, let's go back to Adam, the church data. He has a very different attitude towards church, doesn't he? The church data's attitude towards church is me-centred. What can church do for me? How are my needs being met? What about my personal preferences? Church daters are, are independent, they're disconnected, they're minimally involved in other people's lives, they don't like the idea of accountability. Church daters are critical, they're short on allegiance and quick to find faults. They're essentially looking for the best product for the price of two hours, if that, on a Sunday. They're like the lover with a wandering eye, looking out for something better. And this is a tragic situation. 
because what the church data is thinking is working in their favour, it's actually working against them. It results in a serious loss for them and others because you cannot fulfill the command to love and to serve and to give by being me-centred. Being me-centred, you cannot reflect the family likeness. Final illustration today from a Hollywood movie, not the Oceans series, but this time from the movie Blind Side. This is a great movie based on a true story about an underprivileged African-American uh, boy, Michael. He's taken in and then adopted by a white family, the Tuis. And through their love and care, he develops into a brilliant American football player, so, so much so that many colleges want to recruit him, including the University of Mississippi, known as Ole Miss, where Mr. and Mrs. Tui both went, and where ultimately he decides to go. But this creates a problem, an illegal investigation as to whether the Tuis took him in and unduly influenced him so that he would play for their alma mater. Now, after asking many questions about why other people want him to go to Ole Miss, then the investigator is finally asked by Michael, well, why didn't you ask me what I want to do? Not what other people want. So she said, well, why did you want to go to Ole Miss? And he says this, because it's where my family goes to school. It's where they have always gone to school. It's as simple as that. He's been adopted as a member of the family. The family's school is Old Miss, therefore, he's going to go to Old Miss. And brothers and sisters, being a Christian, it's as simple as that. We have been adopted into God's family. God is a God of love, and so we love each other. As I said at the beginning, today is the commitment conversation. So one final personal question. Are you still dating the church? Are you like Adam, not really ready to commit to his relationship with grace? Content to go along with it, providing he gets what he wants from it, but that's it. But as we've seen, the church is so much more the merely about meeting our spiritual, emotional, or physical needs. The church is part of God's eternal plan. He chose the church to show and tell the world of his glory, his love and mercy and grace. And this message is the world's only hope. If you are a Christian, you have a crucial part to play in that plan. Your life is bigger than even a well-paid, fulfilling job, an understanding spouse, non-delinquent kids, good friends, and an active social life. It's so much bigger than a beautiful house, nine holidays, and fashionable clothes. You are part of something that's immense, something that began before you were born will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen, scattered humanity, gathering them to himself, adopting them as his children, progressively shaping them into the family likeness. And he calls out you, gathers you to himself, adopts you into his family, that you might take your part as his children, reflecting the family likeness and making his glory known. That is what membership is all about. We have been adopted into God's family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be able to call you that. Thank you for calling us out, gathering us together, adopting us as your children. Through your Spirit, help us to reflect your glory. 
set up many more by not you as their father. Through Jesus your son. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, show us your mercy and grant us your salvation. Lord, save the Queen and mercifully hear our prayers. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and make your chosen people joyful. Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, for you are our help and strength. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. O God, the author and lover of peace, in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, your servants, from all assaults of our enemies, that surely trusting in your defence, we may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to uh, continue in, in prayers. Please join me in prayer to God. Our Father in heaven, we praise you as maker of heaven and earth. Thank you for all that is wonderful in your creation and for daily reminders of your glory. May the world see your splendor and praise your name. Creator and sustainer, thank you for the recent rainfall in our country. May the rain fall where it is needed to break the drought, to enable farmers to produce crops and pasture and to replenish water stores. We pray for relief from the wildfires that are burning in the US. Protect those fighting the fires and others whose lives and homes are threatened by these fires. Lord, you have given us life and you have given us this world to enjoy and care for. Help us to use what you have given us responsibly and with wisdom. Thank you for the recent encouraging improvements in Victorian coronavirus infection rates and for the sustained relatively low rates across our country. Thank you that many churches have been able to start meeting again in various forms. We pray for continued reductions in our country and for rates of, inf of infection across the world. We ask that you will give wisdom to leaders around the world and enable economic recovery, especially for the sake of those most at need. We pray too that you will provide a cure for this virus. We pray for people affected by the coronavirus, for the sick, their loved ones and their carers, for those who have lost loved ones to the virus for the isolated and lonely, for the anxious, for those in need of work, for the overworked, for those who are being denied access to special needs services at this time, and for anyone else who is afflicted or in need. Merciful and gracious Lord, give comfort to the lonely, strength to the sick and weak patience and endurance in suffering, generosity in plenty, and thankfulness in all things. Finally, we bring the US elections before you. The Bible tells us that all leaders answer to you. 
raise up a leader who is going to acknowledge you and lead the country in your ways. Guide the decisions they make during their term so that your good plans and purposes are fulfilled. Eternal God, make yourself known that the world will acknowledge you as mighty creator, merciful saviour, loving sustainer and sovereign king and return to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close our prayers by saying the words of the collect together. The words will come up on your screen. God of power and mercy, only with your help can we offer you fitting service and praise. May we live the faith we profess and trust your promise of eternal life. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue our prayers with a prayer of thanksgiving on page 36, uh, the second bottom paragraph. Most merciful Father, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely bestowed on us, for life and health and safety, for power to work and leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and in the lives of men. We praise and glorify your holy name, but above all, we thank you for your spiritual mercies in Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're now going to uh, pray the prayer at point 18. Almighty God, you have given us grace to bring before you with one accord our common supplications, and you promise that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, Lord, the desires and petitions of your servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. We're going to have some announcements now. Hi, St John's. It's James, the Senior Minister here. Let me tell you a little bit about what's happening around the church at the moment. As you will no doubt know, we have started our vision series and accompanying the sermon series is a, a booklet. And you would have been sent this by email and some of you would have picked it up from the church on uh, last Sunday. This is full of very useful information, Bible reading plans, growth group questions, spiritual health checks, next steps you might take, a wealth of hopefully useful uh, stuff and information to accompany the sermon series. And I strongly recommend that you get your hands on a physical copy of the booklet. We can deliver them uh, to you. There's enough for everybody uh, within the church to have one and I strongly recommend that so please let the office know if you uh, can't come to the church and um, you want one then we can drop one in to you thinking of things uh, the church is doing um, for uh, the wider uh, congregation and the possibility of zooming into the prayer meeting the prayer meeting happens every Sunday morning at uh, 9.30, uh, from 9.30 till 10 o'clock, before the 10 o'clock service. So this is a great opportunity to zoom in and pray for particularly the Sunday services. And a link is sent every Friday in the regular email. So uh, if you can do that, um, it's likely if you're at, uh, at 8 o'clock or, or at 4 o'clock or at 6.30, or joining online, please uh, make use of that and join a few of us in prayer, uh, praying for the services. Christmas is coming, sorry to mention it this early uh, in October, but it is coming. One of the lovely things that we like to do is prepare, prepare some Christmas hampers to give to people who within the church or within the community have had a particularly tough year. 
And so if you know people like that, then please, uh, like myself or Anne or Pete, know. But also, if you'd like to make a contribution, uh, a financial contribution to the codes of, of the hamper, then again, uh, let us know. Within the uh, new sheet, there'll be details on um, how you can do that. So that's a wonderful way to love each other this Christmas. One of the uh, joys that I've had um, over the last uh, few years or so is to go out to uh, a foreign country and train pastors. And I'm delighted to say that Anglican Aid has developed a, a sponsorship program for uh, a, a pastor, a student pastor, to go to uh, Bible College. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to support somebody to train them up in learning uh, how to teach uh, God's Word. It's so needed um, and so often they won't be able to do that um, by themselves. Here's uh, Tim Swan, uh, the CEO of Anglican Aid, to tell you a little bit more about this initiative. <music> Anglican Aid is launching an exciting new program to provide Bible training for pastors and Christian leaders across the developing world. How would you like to go to the hospital with some problem and discover a fairly poorly trained doctor? You wouldn't go along those lines. <laughs> well, why on earth do you think it's okay for us to go to church and find a pretty poorly trained pastor teacher? In many cases in Africa, the pastors in the cities do not have any form of theological training. This absence of enduring discipleship has resulted in increasing charlo theology, leaving many local churches subject to whatever errors. Nowadays in Africa, the pulpit has become a place to sell anointed oils. Pulpit has become a place to sell holy water, to sell holy soils. For the students who are sponsored through Anglican Aid, they're going to be learning Handling God's Word, which is one of our foundational courses, where we look deeply at the Bible, and they're learning the skills of deeply studying God's Word. Let's get our strategies straight. Support good theological education. With Anglican Aid, you can sponsor a student to study at a trusted Bible college, which will provide rigorous, culturally relevant Bible training. You'll be able to develop a personal relationship with your sponsored student from commencement to graduation, receive prayer updates, and be part of filling the urgent need for biblically faithful pastors. Bible College Student Sponsorships, equipping the next generation of Christian leaders in developing nations. Find out more at anglicanaid.org.au.
been uh, great spending time with you today, uh, going through morning prayer with you. Uh, and as I, as I said at the beginning, it's great to have you with us if you are new or with us for the first time today. Um, I want to encourage you, if you are, to make contact with us, to go to our St John's website and uh, click on the contact page. And then there's a, a virtual Get Connected form that you can fill out and I would love you to do that so that uh, we, uh, we can get to know you and look after you. As we finish off today, we're going to say the grace together. You'll find that on page 37 of the Australian Prayer Book. Let's say that together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.